Good afternoon and welcome to this virtual seminar. My name is Simon Passfield and I'm the head of the insolvency team at Guildhall Chambers. I'm joined today by my colleague Stefan Rommel, who is a member of our commercial and insolvency teams and will be known to many of you, I'm sure, as one of the leading experts in the country in cross-border insolvency. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and we are delighted to be joined by Julian Alsop and Debbie Grennan, who are two of the senior members of our specialist employment team. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Over the course of the next hour or so, we're going to be looking at the legal and practical consequences of the new coronavirus job retention scheme in an insolvency context. As you might expect, we'll be focusing in particular on the two very recent High Court decisions in the Carluccio's and Debenham's cases, uh, which have provided some clarification as to the interaction between the new scheme and insolvency law. By way of disclaimer, there is still a fair bit of uncertainty, as I hope will become apparent in due course. And while we will, of course, do our utmost to identify the key issues and questions that arise from the decisions in the current climate, we don't necessarily profess to have all of the answers, uh, nor should anything we take we say today be taken uh, to represent legal advice. Before we launch into the talk substantively, just a few pieces of brief housekeeping, if I may. Firstly, if I could ask everyone who's not participating in a speaking capacity to please turn off your video and microphone. That both helps with the bandwidth and also ensures you don't inadvertently pop up on screen when you're scratching your nose or coughing, what have you. Uh, secondly, you'll see that there's PowerPoint slides uh, up in front of you. It's very easy to inadvertently take control of that and change it. So if you can resist the temptation to click on your, your mice, that would be uh, grateful for that. Um, and if you do have any questions arising as the webinar progresses, there is a chat function within Teams itself. So do please feel free to type any queries you have and we'll address them at the end of the talk. Uh, equally, if you'd rather reserve those until the end and raise them already or by way of um, a message, then please feel free to do so. In terms of what we're hoping to cover over the course of this webinar, um, firstly, Julian and Debbie are going to be considering the coronavirus job retention scheme from an employment law perspective. Stefan and I will then take a look at the position from an insolvency law perspective, and we anticipate that those two slots will take, broadly speaking, about an hour. Uh, we will then have a look at any questions that may arise from that. We have identified what we think are probably some common questions that may occur, and so we'll start off by kicking those around. But as I say, if anyone else has anything they would like to ask, then please feel free to do so, and we'll pick those up at the same time time as well uh, and address those in the final slot. So without further ado, I will hand over to Debbie to kick us off on the employment law context of the Coluccio's and Denham's decisions. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for attending this uh, webinar. We hope you enjoy it. My aim this morning in, in kicking off, sorry, this afternoon in, in kicking off this webinar is to start introducing you to some of the key employment law concepts that underpin the factual scenarios that existed in the Carluccio's and Debenham's cases and also to introduce you to the relevant parts of the coronavirus scheme itself. And the reason I'm doing that is so that employment lawyers can really appreciate why these give rise to the kind of issues that um, insolvency practitioners are dealing with at the moment. So if we move on through my slides, we'll start with the scheme itself. Now, much of the detail um, has emerged piecemeal over recent weeks. Um, much of it you'll still yet to be um, clarified. But for our purposes, all we really need to do is to go back to basics. Um, the position we start with is the aim of the scheme. And the whole point of it is to seek to avoid redundancies and maintain the viability of businesses during the immediate crisis. And the way in which this has been achieved is by the government effectively underpinning the, um, the, the, the wages paid to employees so that it remains cost neutral or largely cost neutral for employers to retain employees during this immediate crisis. And at the moment, at least until the end of June. We also need to look at the reason for the furloughing because the scheme isn't completely open-ended. There are some limitations as to when it can be used. 
and the following slide will just set out the circumstances in which the scheme can be um, adopted by employers. The best information we have is in the Treasury direction that was issued to HMRC on the 15th of April. And this sets out the circumstances in which HMRC are expected to um, deal with applications under the scheme. And 2.1 in particular draws that causative link uh, between the claim that is made and the coronavirus consequences, whether they be health, social, economic, whilst we're dealing with this immediate emergency. And then at 2.5, we have um, it being stated that a claim which is deemed abusive or otherwise contrary to the exceptional purposes of the scheme, and those are the purposes set out at 2.1, will not be met. And the reason why I've decided to, to start with this is, is really to bring home the fact that if we're dealing with redundancies or administration, which was inevitably going to be happening now in any event, and cannot be said to have that causa causative link with the coronavirus um, emergency, then we can't expect payment to be made under the scheme. So if we move on to... Um, how the scheme works. I, I'm sure everyone um, in the room, if we had one, would be quite aware of the fact that this is an 80% of salary up to a 2,500 cap um, as payment of wages, plus some incidentals such as employer NI and a contribution to employer pension contributions. Um, but the important point I think for us to note is that the scheme cannot be forced on anybody. Um, it can only be used if both employer and employee either have or can properly be taken to have agreed to its use. So moving on again, the uh, payment mechanism is a really important feature of the cases that were dealt with, which, which uh, no doubt uh, Simon and Stefan will be uh, introducing in, in more detail later. But there is no payment from HMRC to employees. There is no direct relationship between the two. What we have is the uh, employer dealing directly with HMRC and HMRC having nothing to do with the employee at all, even to the extent of refusing to deal with any queries from employees as to whether an application has been made, processed and so on on their behalf. Uh, and the payment is made to the employer by way of a grant um, to the employer. Now, again, that I think is significant because that gave rise to issues to, uh, for insolvency practitioners when it came to the distribution of those funds and the priority which needed to be afforded to that distribution. Um, an important point, and perhaps one of the two most important points of my section of this presentation is this. What happens to the employment contract when an employee is furloughed? Is the contract in some way suspended? Is there a stay placed on the contract whilst the furloughing takes place? And here at least we have a very clear answer and, and it's a very definite no. Um, the employment contract continues unaffected save for the specific variations that furloughing requires. So all other terms of the contract, whether they are express terms or the implied terms, continue in force. Continuity of employment continues. There is no break. The whole point of the scheme is to preserve employment. So except to the extent that the contract is varied, it continues in force. And that then leads us to the question of, well, do we need a variation? And, and the obvious answer of, yes, of course we do. Um, if there were not a, an effective contractual variation, all the overarching obligations under that employment contract, including the obligations to be available for work, to provide work, and for payment to be made in accordance with the contractual obligations, would continue to apply. So if there is no effective variation, we have a situation where an employee who an employer may believe is furloughed is in fact entitled to full pay under that contract, 
And that opens up, of course, the potential for claims for breach of contract, constructive dismissal, and so on. So employees who wish to vary have to be confident that they have a, a variation in place which is effective. And that applies just as much to an administrator as it does to the um, employer. So next question is, if we need to have agreement to furlough, what does that mean? How do we how do we get that agreement? And we have two documents that have given us an insight into what may be required for an agreement to be effective for the purposes of burying the contract. So far, we've had six different versions of the guidance that has been issued piecemeal from time to time. And in every version of that guidance, the position has been clear. And you'll see it in red in your slide. There must be confirmation of the furloughing in writing from the employer to the employee. That's the first thing. There is then no requirement that the employee provides a written response. And if we look at the, the underline in the middle of the um, section here, as long as it's done in accordance with employment law, if it's consistent with employment law, the consent is valid. And that could not be more clear. We're back on basic employment law principles as to when, in the absence of an express agreement in writing, an employee can be taken nonetheless to have consented, to have agreed to a, a variation to the contract. And that's something Julian is going to be looking at in a little more detail in just a few minutes. That all seemed straightforward. Then that all changed on the 15th of April. That's when we had statute uh, guidance, forgive me, we have a Treasury direction from the Treasury to HMRC setting out the circumstances in which a claim may be made, um, made out. Uh, and what we have here is reference to a need for an agreement to be in writing. You see the underlines in this section of the slide um, only applies if the employer and employee have agreed in writing. Question then is, is there an inconsistency between the wording that we saw in the guidance and the wording that we then saw in the Treasury direction just uh, a few days ago. There have been a number of commentators who've expressed the view that there is a difference and read literally, what we need to have is a, a written agreement to which both parties have contributed. And the um, concern that this has posed in employment and other circles is, is obvious. Um, question though, is, is, it, is that right? If we think about it, the whole purpose of this scheme is to encourage retention of employees. And many employers have acted in accordance with the guidance that it stood as it stood at the time they furloughed their employees and relied on a notification followed by no um, objection from the employee to being placed on furlough. Some of those employees have had employees on furlough for several weeks now. Many of them will have already made applications to HMRC for the funding to be reimbursed. It, it's hard to credit um, a position, it's hard to imagine a position where those employers are now told, because you did not have an agreement in writing, you cannot access the furlough scheme in respect of those employees. It would be a massive sea change if that were the case. We delivered this seminar this morning and during that seminar, I explained in, in a little detail as to why it was my view that the interpretation that an agreement in writing is required must be wrong and that actually the guidance must be right. And um, a little bit of hot news just off the press, this afternoon, we have had published a letter from the um, office of the chief executive of HMRC confirming to employers that it is the guidance that needs to be followed and that it is not necessary in each case for an agreement in writing to be in place. 
So finally, we appear, albeit by letter, and albeit published um, with the approval um, of HMRC, we appear now to have guidance that what we do need in place is um, the, the three steps identified in the six versions of the guidance that we have had so far. So at least today, we have had a little more clarity on that. That of course, may well be of some relevance to the uh, the later speakers who are particularly talking about steps that administrators may need to be taking uh, following their appointment. So that's where we are in terms of um, whether there is an inherent inconsistency. If there ever was one, it seems that that inconsistency has now been resolved. So there we are in terms of uh, my very brief introductory section to this presentation. I now hand you over to Julian and he's going to develop a couple of the themes that I've introduced in a little more detail uh, and I'm sure you'll enjoy what he has to say. Thank you. Thank you very much and, and good afternoon to everyone. I hope you're having an excellent day and um, you've had a nice bit of time hopefully outside in the sunshine. Um, I'm going to move on to talk about the question of implied variation um, in the employment context under common law, um, because obviously that's a, a significant issue arising out of Carluccio's, and indeed, given what Debbie has told us um, so far this afternoon, um, will probably be of significant relevance in a, in a number of cases, because obviously um, express variation is often the preferred cause, but as was the case and sought to be the case in Carluccio's, but as we know, it's not infrequently the case that one needs to consider whether there's been an implied variation, usually as a result of an employee working to a purported variation, which has been put to him by his or her employee, employer. Anyway, the leading case in relation to the implied variation of employment contracts is the decision of the Court of Appeal in Abrahol and others versus Nottingham City Council, which itself was cited in Carluccio's at paragraphs 48 to 50. One must bear in mind that employment contracts are relational in nature and the mutual obligations that underpin it can be modified and varied by the employee's conduct, where an employer has made it clear that it wishes to modify the contract of employment in a particular way. As we lawyers are fond of saying, of course, much depends upon the circumstances. The most important factor, though, is that the inference must arise unequivocally. The employee's conduct and continuing to work must be only referable to the proposed variation. So, as such, the approach that we taken by the courts and tribunals in the industrial relations context is to give the employees the benefit of any reasonable doubt where the variation is said to arise by conduct, particularly where that variation is disadvantageous to the employee. And by contrast, of course, the court will more readily infer a variation by conduct where the var variation is deemed to be advantageous. Now, protest or objection by a trade union or a body of employee representatives may be sufficient to negative the inference that individual employees are working without protest, even if those individual employees say nothing at the time. And time's an important point. Employees are to be afforded a reasonable amount of time before it can be properly inferred that they have agreed to a variation of the employment contract, particularly where that variation is on the face of it detrimental to them. So as such, the fact that it might be difficult to identify the precise moment at which the employee should be treated as accepting a contractual pay cut does not mean that question has to be answered once and for all at the point of implementation. So variation of employment contracts mirrors contractual orthodoxy, with the caveat that where a proposed variation is to the overall detriment of the employees, and where consent is not expressly given by the employees to the variation, the court should be slow to infer a variation where the employee's conduct is equivocal. And so in the light of the principles that I've just referred to, it's no surprise that Mr. Justice Snowden decided that non-responding employees in Carluccio's, i.e. those who had not responded to the variation letter at the time the matter came before him, had not consented to the variation proposed by the administrators. On passant, one issue that was not considered in Carluccio's, but which might be of use in similar circumstances, is Regulation 9 of TUPI 2006, which provides for permitted variations to the employment contracts of the affected workforce where the transferor to a TUP transfer is in relevant insolvency proceedings, such as administration. Now, Regulation 9 is not one of the parts of TUP that is frequently referred to or cited, 
uh, but nonetheless, it's worth considering. It permits variations where the sole or principal reason for the variation is the transfer and is not an economic, technical or organizational reason entailing changes in the workforce and the variation designed to safeguard employment opportunities by ensuring the survival of the undertaking business or part of the undertaking or business that is the subject of the relevant transfer. So, for instance, a transfer related pay cut with no other changes to the workforce would be within the scope of Regulation 9. However, if there was a change to the workforce contemplated by the variation, then it would not fall within scope. So if there was such an economic, technical or organizational reason, it would be possible for the employees themselves to agree contractual changes by Regulation 4, subparagraph 5 of GP 2006, but not under Regulation 9. So where you're in Regulation 9 territory, Regulation 9 enables those permitted variations to be effective where they are agreed by appropriate representatives of the assigned employees. In other words, representatives of those employees who are assigned to the undertaking that is to be transferred. The appropriate representatives are the recognized trade unions, or if they're not relevant to some, to all or some of the workforce, the elected employee representatives. But so long as express consent is received in accordance with the terms of Regulation 9, the permitted variations would be contractually binding. Now, one issue, of course, is whether there's adequate time in the transaction. But if there was or if there was sufficient pre-planning, Regulation 9 might be a neat way of getting past the issues posed by employees in a similar position to the non-responding employees in Carluccio's, as effective consent to furlough could be achieved on a collective basis. In any event, where there is a recognized union, employers, of course, should bear in mind, given that at the present time we're concerned with the prospect of a variation of a significant number of employment contracts, that pursuant to section 178 subparagraph 2 and section 181 subparagraph 2 of the Trade Union Labor Relations Consolidation Act 1992, the union has a right to information upon its request in relation to, amongst other things, its ability to collectively bargain over the terms and conditions of employment or physical working conditions, the engagement or non-engagement, as it may be, termination or suspension of employment or duties of one or more workers. It may also be relevant to consider whether there is a collective agreement that requires information and collective consultation in any event outside of the usual statutory provisions relating to collective consultation in the event of a proposal to dismiss 20 or more workers on the grounds of redundancy. See, of course, section 188, subparagraph section 1 and of the Trade Union Labor Relations Consolidation Act 1992 and um, the, the, the provisions of Regulation 13 of TUPI 2006, where we're talking about TUPI transfers. So moving on then to the next um, part of Carluccio's, um, which, which, it, which it touches and concerns employment law, we look at the question of whether or not there's a duty to apply under the CJRS. And this was the final issue that was considered in the Carluccio's case, and that was whether or not the administrators themselves were under a duty to apply under the CJRS in respect of any of the employees to whom the variation letter had been sent. The submission that was put was based upon the bedrock of the implied term of trust and confidence, coupled with the common law authorities in which a right to serve notice of termination can be constrained in certain circumstances by the implication of a term, particularly where there is a benefit under or incidental to the, co to the contract of employment that can be relied upon as an alternative to dismissal. In the case of Aspton versus Webb's Poultry and Meat Group Holdings Limited, and this is a case that was referred to um, expressly in, in Carluccio's, it was held by Mr. Justice Sedley, as he then was, that a right under the contract of employment to terminate in the event of prolonged illness could be limited in circumstances by an implied term where it was known at the time the contract was entered into that the employees could benefit from a permanent health insurance scheme if they remained in employment for the duration of their incapacity. That implied term did not prevent summary dismissal in the meantime for gross misconduct, but nevertheless was a fetter for other types of dismissal and notice, particularly in the circumstances where there would be a benefit uh, in continued employment. The principle in Aspton was approved by the Court of Appeal over to in Brompton versus AOC International Limited in Unum, and this case was also um, referred to in, 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 in argument in Carluccio's and refined its way into the judgment at that appropriate part. More recently, in the case of AWAN versus ICTS Limited, which you'll find in the Industrial Relations Law Reports, the 2019 um, edition at page 212, 
it was held that a term might be implied to prevent the employer from depriving the employee of a long-term disability plan. And then probably of even more relevance to the uh, those who um, deal with insolvency practitioners or indeed insolvency practitioners on this call, um, if you move away from the um, fruits of occupational insurance benefits, you'll find the case of Genvi and Australian Broadcasting Corporation, where it was held that there was an implied term in the case of an impending redundancy that employers would not dismiss for some other reason without cause, so as to deny an employee, employee of his rights under a contractual scheme for enhanced redundancy rights. So ultimately, much will depend upon the terms of the contract. If the contract is particularly detailed as to the way in which dismissal is to be conducted in certain scenarios, there may be less room for the implication of an implied term. However, if the contract contains a more straightforward power to dismiss on notice, then there is more scope for the implication of an implied term on the right to serve notice of dismiss. One should also bear in mind the related issue of whether or not a dismissal is fair within the meaning of Section 98.4 of the Employment Rights Act 1996, even if notice has been lawfully served. And the line of cases beginning with First West Yorkshire and Hague would suggest that where there is the prospect of an enhanced pension on retirement through ill health, an employer will also be expected to take reasonable steps to ascertain whether the employee is entitled to the benefit of ill health retirement before fairly dismissing that employee on account of their ill health. And if they don't, there may well be an issue in respect of the fairness of the dismissal. So drawing together the wrongful dismissal and the unfair dismissal jurisprudence that I've just referred to, I would respectfully disagree with the view expressed by Ms. Justice Snowden at paragraph 106 of the Coluccio's judgment. So subject to the question of adoption and super priority, which Simon and Stefan are better placed to address you on, viewed through the prism of employment law, I consider there is a real risk of liability where the administrator does not take steps to make a precautionary application of the CJRS scheme, even where there are employees who have not responded, but of course not objected, to the request to vary their contracts of employment to enable furlough to take place, as the direction of travel is otherwise, as the direction of travel rather otherwise is, to, is towards dismissal on the grounds of redundancy. And I consider in the current circumstances, an employment tribunal or judge would take a sympathetic view towards a claim brought by an employee in similar circumstances. So that's um, the, the second employment issue arising out of the Carluccio's case. And so to see how that um, plays out um, through the prism of insolvency law, I'm going to pass you on to um, Stefan Raymel, who will take you into the next part of this talk. Thank you very much. Uh, Julian and Debbie, uh, thank you very much for um, uh, those that commentary on the um, employment aspects of the furlough scheme. Uh, so moving on to the uh, insolvency stroke administration part of the scheme, uh, what Simon and I propose to do is to um, divide this segment up of the webinar as follows. Um, a, a bit like the, I suppose, the life cycle of a claim into the scheme, we'll look at, uh, to begin with, how you get into the scheme, what uh, uh, requirements you have to fulfil and so on. Once you're in the scheme, uh, and this is where we'll look at Carluccio's and Debenham's in some detail, how are payments received by the administrator or the other office holder to be treated in the relevant insolvency? Uh, and finally, the third phase will be to look at um, what happens when the scheme comes to an end. Uh, and it's the part of the talk that Simon has flagged uh, in saying unintended consequences. So uh, the, the first part, how, how do you get into the scheme? Um, there is, uh, I think, a prior question, uh, which is, is it available in different insolvency processes? We know, of course, from the guidance, which is on the government website, that plainly uh, it's envisaged that administrators uh, might seek to access the scheme. And it's not difficult to see why that might be the case. After all, uh, in administration, it's not unusual for companies to carry on trading. Um, but what about other insolvency processes, say, for example, liquidation or in a voluntary arrangement or, or even in a bankruptcy? So uh, a couple of thoughts on each of those. And it's very worth emphasizing, of course, that uh, whilst we helpfully have Carluccio's and Debenham's on administration, we don't actually have any cases which supports uh, the contention that another insolvency process might uh, apply just as effectively. Um, taking liquidation first, um, I, I think purely from a practical perspective, uh, it's probably quite unlikely that there are going to be that many situations in which uh, trading is going to continue for long enough to mean that it's worthwhile to have to decide whether or not to furlough some staff. 
Um, now, even if one were to get over what I think is really a practical uh, difficulty, it, it may actually not be as straightforward as in administration. And I, I know, Simon, when we were preparing this talk, you came across some, some guidance in the uh, Official Receivers Technical Manual uh, as to how employees in a liquidation are treated. Yes, thanks, Stefan. It's addressed in two places in the technical manual. Firstly, in paragraph 8.67, the point is made that the effect of a winding up order or indeed a bankruptcy order is to automatically terminate employees employment on that date and that if the business is to continue moving forward then what will usually happen is that the employment will be terminated because of the automatic termination uh, and then in effect the employees who continue to work will commence a new contract from the date of the insolvency event moving forward and then this theme is then picked up in paragraph 62.20 where the point is made that um, there is a perhaps a tension or concern on the part of um, liquidators as to whether if they take on employees moving forward or continue to employ them by doing so they are adopting that contract personally and, and exposing themselves to personal liability to pay the salary rather than it simply being an expense in the usual waterfall and so on, on pragmatic grounds what will usually happen is that the liquidator will confirm the termination of the employee's employment, then enter into a fresh contract, but making it clear that they are doing so as an agent of the company, not as the personal liability of that particular office holder, uh, so that they can ensure that any payments that are to be made will be uh, a liquidation expense if there's sufficient funds, but not something they're personally liable to, to pay. Um, thanks, Simon. Of course, um, and, and as you'll see very shortly when we come on to look at Carduccio's and Debenhams, what that doesn't necessarily mean for a liquidation, a trading liquidation, uh, is whether or not uh, any uh, liability to pay the employees as an expense would have some form of um, super priority. Um, so so that, that deals with liquidation. I, I might just add uh, provisional liquidation, which doesn't appear on the slide. Uh, and I know certainly in some quarters uh, in recent publications, there have been suggestions that um, <clears throat> Uh, trading liquidations uh, are going to be a more popular means of business rescue in these circumstances. Um, provisional liquidations certainly might be, not least because uh, even when a provisional liquidator is appointed, uh, it wouldn't be unusual for there to be a gap in time, of course, between presentation of the petition uh, and hearing of the petition. Uh, and that might mean that the uh, insolvency practitioner is in control for a sufficiently long period of time uh, to need to continue trading. And that might trigger whether or not it is necessary to furlough employees. Uh, of course, um, the source of um, a provisional liquidator's powers tends to derive from the court order appointing them, and the same point goes in relation to expenses and how any receipts from the furlough scheme might be treated. Uh, so any, any uh, clients who are looking to make an application to that effect at the moment should be well advised to reflect on any provisions which might need to be included in the order uh, on that point. Uh, the, the next uh, insolvency process uh, obviously is uh, voluntary arrangements, CVAs or IVAs. Uh, it's a more obvious case, uh, I would have thought, in which uh, a company might have to furlough employees. Uh, the starting point is likely to be the company is still trading. Uh, the possibly interesting legal issues which might arise here uh, derive from who might uh, propose it, uh, director or supervisor. Uh, the answer is likely to be found in the terms of the voluntary arrangement. Um, if furloughing does take place, is it going to be necessary to vary the voluntary arrangement, in which case, of course, creditor buying will be necessary? Uh, and how are receipts going to be treated uh, from the furlough scheme in the voluntary arrangement? For example, will they be uh, a voluntary arrangement asset? Again, the, the answer to that is likely to turn on the terms of the voluntary arrangement, but those might be matters which uh, need to be thought about uh, in, in supervisors who are supervisors of companies in the voluntary arrangement at the moment. Um, bankruptcy, well, that's uh, much rarer to have a trading bankruptcy where a bankrupt might need to furlough employees. And certainly I can think of only one case in my practice. Um, there are difficult legal issues, and this webinar isn't the place to cover them, as to whether or not employment contracts vest in the insolvency practitioner, uh, who runs the business, the practitioner or the bankrupt under delegated powers. But if one were to overcome those uh, legal issues, then in principle, uh, it probably ought to be possible to uh, for a, a trustee in bankruptcy or a bankrupt to furlough employees uh, it is, as an administrator might. Um, so uh, during um, her section of the webinar, Debbie explained some of the criteria for accessing the scheme. Uh, there is an insolvency specific one which is contained in the guidance and which is the second bullet point on the slide that you have uh, before you. 
uh, the guidance provides that uh, it would be expected an administrator would only access a screen uh, and then there are two uh, key phrases in my view at least if there is a reasonable likelihood of, of rehiring the um, the worker sorry so uh, looking at the first phrase reasonable likelihood uh, and it's helpful to think of it uh, as an answer to several questions so for example who has to decide that there is a reasonable likelihood when does that decision have to be made uh, and on what basis uh, does the decision have to be made in respect of all or, or some only of the employees? Um, the, the, the first question, well, the likelihood is um, in an insolvency, it'll be the insolvency practitioner, providing furloughing hasn't happened before the appointment of the practitioner. Uh, so, for example, in Carluccio, it was, it was the administrators who had to make the decision. Uh, at what point does one make the decision to go into the furlough scheme? And I think here it's helpful to just have in mind uh, the, the steps which are required. Um, we've heard in, in very helpful detail from uh, Debbie and Julian whether or not a variation of the contract is necessary, and that's plainly one step. Uh, there might be another step, you might say, which is actually submitting some form of application into the scheme, which is a second step. Uh, and then, as in Carlucci, as in Debenhams, it might be necessary for you to make an application to court, which means your evidence will have to deal, as it did in Carluccio's, with whether or not the reasonable likelihood threshold was met. Uh, it, it's goes without saying that uh, decisions like this really ought to be documented if they're going to be scrutinised in due course, and it's not difficult to foresee circumstances in which that might happen. Um, but also, it's worth making the point that situate, uh, sorry, a trading administration or any administration, uh, the position on the ground changes very quickly. And so whilst it might be appropriate to furlough at one of those stages, uh, in fact, that may have changed for reasons outside the administrator's control. Um, and that throws up interesting questions uh, as we'll, as we'll go. Um, now, the, the phrase reasonable likelihood, what does it actually mean? Um, is it necessary for the insolvency practitioner to have had an offer for the business? Uh, what about if he's had an expression of interest? Uh, and that was the position in Carluccio's. The uh, judgment of Mr Justice Snowden recalls that the insolvency practitioners in that case had had expressions of interest in purchasing the Carluccio's business. Uh, what, on the other hand, if the IP has not had any expressions of interest, but has general experience of acting in these sorts of companies in the relevant sector uh, and knows that nine times out of ten, the business will be sold as a going concern. Is that enough to mean that there is a reasonable likelihood? Uh, the, the final question that I pose is, does it apply to all employees? Now, uh, why, why should it apply to all employees? If, for example, you're able to separate out different processes in the business, there might be uh, frontline employees in the business who are manufacturing something, providing a service, and then you might have back office staff who are doing different functions. Is it necessary to furlough all of them? Do you have to apply the reasonable likelihood test to each category of employee? Um, Simon, in, in due course, will deal later on with what happens if uh, uh, HMRC were to reject a claim, uh, and that turns in part on the status of the relevant employment contract. Uh, if the decision to furlough turns out, to, sorry, even if you furlough and that's rejected, uh, who has the liability to pay that employee? Um, in administration, uh, there might be a question arising as to which purpose of administration the administrators are pursuing. Uh, plainly, uh, little a, rescuing the company as a going concern will be fine, uh, but B and C, uh, achieving a better result for creditors or making a distribution to a secured creditor might be more open to doubt. And it might depend on factors such as, for example, whether or not the business is being sold on a going concern or on a breakup basis. Um, the, the last phrase, uh, just to draw attention to the last word even, is rehiring. Um, and, and it might be thought that it's not a, a terrible, help, terribly helpful way of expressing the, the concept they're getting at. Uh, rehiring suggests that the hire has ceased, but as Debbie has very clearly explained, the effect of furloughing from an employment law perspective is not to cause the contract to cease to exist. Uh, rather, um, it, it's paused, I suppose you might say, maybe not even that, Debbie may not agree with that, uh, but the contract is still there. So um, I, I'm not sure one can talk in terms of rehiring. Uh, the way Snowden analyzed, analyzed that was to say that if the business is transferred uh, to a new co and the restrictions imposed by coronavirus uh, are lifted and the activity is resumed, then the, the employee will be treated as being rehired. Um, but as we'll see uh, in the unintended consequences section, the rehired uh, wording might support um, a slightly different conclusion to the one reached by the, um, by the two judges. Um, I, I think that takes us, Simon, to the uh, part of the talk where we're in the scheme uh, and there are questions arising as to uh, what, how income in the scheme is treated. Yes, well, 
that final point that Stefan makes is, is a good one because it alights upon at least one of the tensions between the wording of the scheme such as it is and the interaction with insolvency law and of course understandably the government had been working apace in, in the drafting of the scheme and presumably haven't had time to necessarily iron out all of the kinks when it comes to how it sits alongside and applies with the current insolvency legislation but prime example there of talking in the language of rehiring despite the fact that conceptually it appears that the contracts continue in existence and therefore it's not a question of, of rehiring or re-employing the employees it's a question of them returning back into the existing employment on, on the current contract before we come to look at that in some more detail and, and because that really underpins the Carluccio's and Debenham's decisions first really by way of revision just remind you of the treatment by way of insolvency law of contracts of employment in administration. The starting point obviously is that any obligations that arise under a contract of employment will fall within the definition of debt within rule 14.1 sub rule 3 of the insolvency rules and so therefore the starting point is that obligations payable to uh, employees in administration will be an unsecured debt. That is, of course, subject to the preferential treatment that is given to certain parts of liabilities arising in respect of employees. Uh, and by virtue of Section 386 of the Act and Schedule 6, certain categories of payments to employees are made preferential debts. That is to say, debts which will have priority to the interests of floating charge creditors uh, and the unsecured creditors generally when it comes to floating charge realisations. Uh, and that includes pension contributions, unpaid wages for a period of up to four months prior to the administration up to a maximum of £800 per employee, accrued holiday pay for a period of 12 months uh, and um, protective awards. However, paragraph 99 then provides a mechanism whereby if an administrator adopts the contracts of employment of employees, then from the date of adoption any liabilities for wages and salary arising thereafter will become expenses of the administration and they will become expenses in the statutory waterfall which rank above the administrator's own remuneration and expenses which is why we talk of those liabilities as having super priority. The definition of wages and salary extends to holiday pay and pensions uh, and that is important for this reason which is we'll come on to see there is at the moment some uncertainty as to whether the job retention scheme by which the government will reimburse payments extends as far as that. So does it cover uh, holiday payments and pension payments? And the significance of that is, of course, that where a contract has been adopted and the administrators have incurred a liability to make such payments, it may well be that they don't recover in full from the government. Uh, the additional matters which would be given super priority and which would fall to be paid as expenses of the administration. Uh, the uh, two points to stress though in respect to paragraph 99 is first as I already said it only applies to liabilities which arise from the date of adoption forward so any accrued liabilities for wages and the like which had accrued prior to the date of adoption of the contract will be in the ordinary fashion an ordinary unsecured debt subject to the preferential treatment of the elements of it which fall within the relevant section in schedule six. Uh, but more fundamentally, more importantly, the Act specifically gives administrators a 14 day grace period during which any actions taken by them uh, will not amount to or co contribute to adoption of a contract. So during that period, administrators can take any actions they want without fear of inadvertently thereby uh, conferring super priority status on any employment liabilities arising uh, during that period. The provision in question, paragraph 99, has its roots in the old part two of the Insolvency Act, that's to say the old style of administration uh, that predated the Enterprise Act uh, and the amendments to administrative receivership and the like. Uh, and it was introduced in response to the decision of the Court of Appeal in the case of Nickel and Cuts, which was a case concerning receivership, but which it was common ground applied with equal force to administrative receiverships and indeed administrations. Uh, and in that case, in essence, what happened is that a receiver had instructed or engaged uh, some employees to carry out work as an agent of the company in question. Uh, but the court held that the, the employees then had no recourse against the receiver to enforce the payment of those wages, the work they'd done, when there was insufficient funds to pay them out of the estate. That was understandably perceived to be unfair. Uh, and so that was 
effectively uh, undone by the introduction of the equivalent of what is now paragraph 99. That then logically leads on to the question of what amounts to adoption of a contract of employment. So at what point does the liability to the employee have the super priority status conferred upon it? That is a question that was most definitively considered nearly 25 years ago by the House of Lords in the case of um, Paramount Airways. In that case, the administrators had followed um, a procedure that had sprung up as a result of an unreported decision called specialised mouldings, which is that administrators would write to employees of the company confirming that their salaries would continue to be paid, but unilaterally asserting that the administrators would not be adopting the contracts of employment or accepting personal liability for them. So in Paramount, the administrators had followed that practice. Two employees challenged this and argued that notwithstanding the assertion that the administrators were not adopting the contract, the very nature of continuing them in employment amounted to adoption, and so therefore those employees had super priority. The matter went up to the House of Lords. Uh, the leading judgment was given by Lord Brown Wilkinson. His starting point was to note that the appointment of an administrator, unlike the appointment of a liquidator, does not of itself terminate a contract of employment. The corollary of that, therefore, is that the mere continuation of employment does not mean that the administrator has automatically adopted the contract. Per Lord Brown Wilkinson, what is required is that there is some conduct on the part of the administrator which amounts to an election to treat the continued contract of employment as giving rise to a separate liability in the administration. Lord Brown Wilkinson went on to say that it is not possible to adopt a contract or purport to adopt a contract on a conditional or limited basis. It's all or nothing. So either the contract of employment is adopted or it isn't. Now, slightly unhelpfully, if I can put it that way, he then drew this all together in his conclusion. And the language he used is perhaps apt to misinterpretation, uh, or, or at least ha having been considered in the Carluccio's and Debenham's case, one can see how a, a skillful forensic analysis by a counsel who's wishing to adopt a particular position might lead to suggesting it means something contrary to what had been said in the preceding paragraphs. But because what Lord Brown Wilkinson said in summary was that an employee's contract of employment is adopted if he is continued in employment for more than 14 days. And that phrase, continued employment, is somewhat ambiguous because it's arguable, and was indeed argued in the later cases we'll show in a minute, uh, that if after 14 days you haven't terminated the contract, you have continued them in employment. But of course, that sits slightly uneasily with the suggestion there needs to be a positive act or conduct on the part of the administrator. That, therefore, then is the context in which we consider adoption generally. The issue that's arisen in the two most recent cases is in the specific context of furloughed employees and what actions are needed, or, or, or to put it another way, what actions constitute adoption of the contract in that context. The first of those decisions was that of Mr Justice Snowden in Carluccio's, uh, which Stefan will consider now. Uh, Simon, thank you uh, very much. The um, Just a, a very scene setting reminder of the of, of the facts of Carluccio's. Uh, the branches of the restaurant group closed in mid-March. Uh, the group went into administration on the 30th of March. Uh, the strategy of the administrators was to mothball the business and in parallel seek a sale uh, to achieve a better result uh, than in a winding up. Uh, rather than uh, make all employees uh, redundant, the administrators wanted to access the uh, furlough scheme and they wrote to the employees inviting them to agree variations of their contracts which would provide that the employees would only be paid 80% uh, of their wages if and when the administrators received funds from the scheme. Uh, a sort of um, pay when paid uh, uh, scenario if you will. Um, by the time it got to uh, Mr Justice uh, Snowden, the insolvency issue that he recorded uh, he was addressing was uh, whether or not the administrators would be able to avoid incurring liabilities by adoption of the unvaried contracts of employees who have not responded to the variation letter. Uh, so they are not forced to have to make all of those employees redundant before the end of the first 14 days of the administration. Uh, in, in reality, the debate then soon moved on to whether or not 
uh, when receipts from the scheme are arrived in the hands of the administrators, they are treated either as having super priority under paragraph 99, or whether they could be applied in a distribution by way of paragraph 66, and the difference being the super priority. Now, one submission which appears to have been made to uh, Mr Justice Snowden was that uh, to the extent that, as Simon has, has explained, paragraph 99.5 was brought in uh, to cure the nickels and cuts mischief, the idea that an employee would continue working for a receiver or administrator, but would have no recourse uh, for payment. Uh, this, in a sense, is the reverse of that. Uh, the, the employee is specifically being asked not to work uh, for the company uh, and the money is going to come from the government scheme. Therefore, there is no need, so it was argued, uh, to have anything to do with paragraph 99.5. Five. Uh, 66, uh, so it would be said, was the root. Now, Snowden uh, re rejected that contention uh, principally because in paragraph 99.5, it, it doesn't say anything about whether or not the employee is or isn't rendering services. Uh, and if paragraph 99.5 was meant to be excluded from this scenario, then it ought to have said so clearly. Um, e even outside the context of the coronavirus crisis, uh, Mr Justice Snowden thought there might be other examples of cases where it would be useful for an employee to be kept on and placed in furlough, even if they're not working, uh, for example, to keep restrictive covenants going. Um, ultimately, his conclusions were that by failing to terminate a contract, uh, an administrator doesn't automatically adopt that contract. He also said uh, the same is true if furloughing is undertaken, uh, and query what, what he means by furloughing, within 14 days of the appointment. However, if an administrator does one or other of these two things, uh, either makes an application under the scheme or makes a payment under a varied contract, that would amount to adoption for the purposes of paragraph 99.5, uh, assuming, of course, that those acts take place outside the 14 days of appointment. Now, uh, one is left thinking in reaction to that, well, why is that the case? If you bear in mind what Simon has just been through uh, in discussing Paramount and Lord Brown Wilkinson's conclusions about conduct, uh, the, the explanation we find in paragraph 91 of Carluccio uh, the, the, the key part of this citation is, is the latter half of it. Uh, by doing one of those things, the administrator will be doing an act which could only be explicable on the basis that they were electing to treat the varied contract as giving rise to liabilities which qualify for super priority. Uh, and and this, this submission was made in, in Debenhams, but that, that raises the question why? Just because the administrator participates in the scheme and pays money to employees having received it from the screen, why does that mean that the, the administrator is treating uh, those receipts as having super priority. Um, if paragraph 66 works, then they wouldn't have super priority at all. Um, the, the, um, the, the question was left open, uh, if you like, in uh, Carluccio, uh, and it was raised uh, squarely in, in Debenhams, um, to which uh, Simon is now going to turn. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, and just briefly, by way of background to Debenhams, this is a case in which the administrators are attempting to pursue what's being dubbed in the press a light touch administration. That is to say, an administration to achieve the first of the three statutory purposes of rescuing the companies that are going concern. The, the hope being that by furloughing all the, com the company's employees or the vast majority of them on a temporary basis, the company will be able to survive the crisis and, and, and come back swinging and still trading um, profitably. Uh, so the management team remain in place with the assistance of the administrator and the benefit of the moratorium and the other statutory protections. Now in Debenhams the employees were actually furloughed before the company entered into administration but following their appointment the administrators sought and obtained confirmation from the overwhelming majority of creditors, uh, sorry of employees rather, uh, that they consented to the, the furlough of their contracts. The reason or why the matter ends up in front of the court is because the administrators, despite the decision uh, in Carluccio, has remained concerned about adopting the contracts of employment. And this was for two reasons predominantly. Firstly, as I've already alluded to, there's a lack of clarity with the sick pay and holiday pay, uh, which would qualify for super priority under paragraph 99, are reimbursable under the scheme so that there is this possible uh, discrepancy between the amount of money that can be recovered from HMRC and the amount that the administrator is notionally liable to pay by way of administration expense if they adopt contract. 
The second concern was that although the majority of employees consented to furlough, there was still a sizable number who hadn't responded. And the concern on the administrator's part was that if they inadvertently adopted those contracts, uh, then that could have serious consequences, which means that they would have to dismiss some or all of those employees uh, and then look to re-employ them at a later date, which would then reduce the value of the business as a whole uh, and therefore have a detrimental effect on the attempts to rescue the company. Now, the consideration of the question as to how adoption works was very squarely at the front of the court as it was in the earlier Carluccio's decision. Mr Justice Trow, as one might expect, started by going back to Lord Brown Wilkinson in Paramount. Uh, he noted that, uh, as we've already seen Mr Justice Snowden making the same point, that for adoption to take place, you need to identify some conduct by the administrators which causes the relevant contract to be continued. Uh, and as Stefan has pointed out, as Mr Justice Snowden said yet again, based on Lord Brown Wilkinson, of course, the mere continuation of the employment is not enough. Um, but if the employee is continued in employment for more than 14 days, then that is sufficient. Uh, and what Mr Justice Trower said was that by continuing to cause the company to treat a person as an employee by any action taken subsequent to the expiry of the 14 day period, the contract of employment will have been adopted. So that's just a pure recitation of paramount. And then applying that to the facts of the instant case, he said that by causing the uh, administrators to make an application under the JRS and in making payments, uh, the administrators will be engaging in positive conduct, which presupposes that the contracts of the furloughed employees continue to exist and in fact treat that as being the case. And, and the reason for that is this, is that the terms of the JRS itself presuppose um, that there are wages to be paid because the way the scheme works, as Debbie's explained, is that the employer seeks reimbursement from HMRC of the proportion of wages which it has or will have to pay. And, and therefore, there must be a contract of employment in existence in the first place for there to be a liability to pay wages in order to access the scheme. Uh, and so that's the basis why applying to the scheme must necessarily be consistent with the contract of employment existing. Mr Justice Trower, as Mr Justice Snowden had done, rejected the argument uh, that it's only possible to adopt a contract where services are being provided, or to put it negative, it's not possible to adopt a contract where there's no services being provided. Uh, largely because in this particular case, the retention of the employees was necessary to achieve the purpose because, of course, the whole underlying purpose of the administration, rescuing the company is a going concern, requires the, employment, the employees largely to stay in situ. But also, more importantly, the JRS itself requires the administrators to act as if not only the contracts continue, but also there are separate liabilities arising there under uh, so that the, the furlough and the JRS can be accessed. Now, just a few points arising from those decisions. And the first point to make is that in both of those cases, the variation letters, which were the mechanism by which the administrators were able to furlough the contracts of employment and um, reduce the amount they had to pay, were sent out within the first 14 days. And we know that any act taken within the first 14 days cannot amount to, to adoption because we're told that by the statute. What those decisions don't have to answer is if steps are taken after the 14 day period to furlough employees, does that amount to adoption? And it seems logically that it must, not least because in, in both cases, the judges were able to find the conclusion that there'd been no adoption by the furlough because that happened in the 14 day window. But it seems pretty clear that if an administrator writes to an employee after 14 days, asking them to agree to a variation of their contract of employment and the employee agrees, Clearly, the administrator must be adopting that very contract because they want that contract to exist. That then throws up the question of whether there might be other intermediary steps after the sending of the variation letter, but before the application for payment to the scheme, which amount to positive conduct, which if done out with the 14 day period, could amount to adoption. It's clear from these decisions um, that making an application, of course, at the very latest stage is the point when the contracts are adopted and Stefan posed the question right at the start which I can now answer well what happens if you're 
apply to the scheme and HMRC reject it because for whatever reason they decide you're not eligible. Well, it's, it strikes us that it's, it's plainly obvious from these decisions, if they are right, and Stefan's got something to say about whether they're right or not in a minute, I know, um, that if by making the application itself you've adopted the contracts, then you become liable at that point in time to pay those employees their wages with super priority under Power 99. And if the government refuses to reimburse you, that doesn't affect the obligation to pay. And so administrators need to be very wary of circumstances in which they may inadvertently take on super priority as an expense for salaries of employees they hope to furlough who aren't capable of being furloughed for whatever reason. That then leads us uh, neatly on to paragraph 66, which Stefan mentioned before. And just to remind you, this is the provision which, in essence, gives the court the ability to authorise an administrator to make payments otherwise in accordance with the statutory scheme, which are not distributions to creditors and don't fall within the bracket of payments which can be treated as necessary or incidental to the performance of the administrator's functions. Because both of the judges in Carluccio's and Debenham's decided that paragraph 99 was the answer and regulated the circumstances in which uh, super priority applied or not, they didn't have to have recourse, recourse to paragraph 66. They did, however, leave open the question of whether or not paragraph 66 is a potential source of power for the court to authorise the administrators to make payments. Uh, and indeed, Mr Justice Snowden suggested in Carlucci shows that he could see some attraction in the recourse being had to it. The problem is, if the judges have decided that the, the proper analysis is contracts are adopted when you apply to the scheme, then, then Power 99 has its own statutory code for how you, you make those payments. You don't need to have recourse to paragraph 66, it's of no help. However, Stefan thinks that he may have alighted upon an answer that circumvents all of this and doesn't require us to look at the Insolvency Act at all. Uh, it might be a means of perhaps getting around the two decisions in Carluccio's and Debenham's, if I can put it in those crude terms, Stefan. Well, I, I, Simon, thank you. I, I'm not sure I'd put it quite that high, but, um, uh, uh, and uh, maybe if I preface this with a word of warning about um, Carluccio's and, and Debenham's, uh, it's worth remembering that they are decisions made effectively without the benefit uh, of adversarial argument being received by either of the judges, at least it doesn't appear on, on these points. And moreover, they are decisions which have been made on the basis of guidance. Uh, and in the case of Carluccio, it's not even the, the Treasury paper, which uh, Debbie mentioned, which came out on uh, the 15th of April. Um, so, so these are decisions on a statutory instrument or, or, or a case. Uh, it, it is fair to say that in Carluccio's, it appears it was uh, tentatively suggested that the funds which the administrator receives from HMRC, which are then going to be used uh, for the pay when paid uh, part of it to the employees, could be trust monies. But uh, Mr Justice Snowden rejected that argument. Now, the, the position moved on a little bit after the publication of his judgment in the Treasury guidance. Uh, and in particular, paragraph uh, 2.4 uh, of that guidance and, and skipping over the, the preliminary bits which deal with HMRC making uh, what I'm about to describe public. Uh, but they have to tell a person who, making, who makes the claim that that person has to accept two things. Little a, uh, that the payment made pursuant to such a claim is made only for the purposes of the scheme. Uh, and little b, that the payment must be returned to HMRC immediately upon the person making the CJR's claim becoming unwilling or unable to use the payment for the purposes of uh, the scheme. Now, it, it might very well be thought uh, on the strength of that wording, and if, if that's the, the, the legal basis upon which the payments are going to be made by HMRC to administrators, that there is a quiz closed or resulting trust which arises, uh, and indeed, uh, the Niagara Mechanical Services International case is not uh, a million miles removed from uh, what I have just described, and that it was a company uh, which was debtor of a second company, which paid funds to the administrator of the second company uh, for the sole purpose of allowing that administrator to pay a subcontractor. Uh, and in that case, it was held that there was a quiz closed trust. Now, if there is a quiz closed trust, uh, then those funds arguably are never within the control of the administrator. So paragraph 99 doesn't become engaged, in which case it would be necessary to fall back on paragraph uh, 66. Um, but but the the potential arguments, as I've just outlined them, I don't think were developed in quite that way in the in the Carluccio's and Devenham's cases. Um, Simon, I, I think this takes us to the, the unintended consequences, which is um, if you think back to the, the start of this section of the webinar where I said we we're going to look at it through the life cycle of the scheme. Uh, and I think the first set of unintended consequences is just to reflect on uh, what happens 
uh, upon cessation or withdrawal of the scheme for whatever reason. So to postulate a scenario, let's assume for a moment that we are on the 1st of July, the scheme has ended, uh, an administrator has furloughed their employees and in current case law has adopted the contracts. Now, uh, we know from what Debbie says that uh, at that point, the, the company's obligations under the contracts are revived. Uh, they are expensive, the administration, even though there's now no receipts from the government. Of course, uh, and vigorous nodding or, 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 or thumbs up from Debbie or Julian here will confirm this. But the second bullet point, of course, it's possible to make the employees redundant, but there will be a process involved in that. And there may well be liabilities which accrue whilst that's taking place. Um, so standing back for a moment, and the final question that, that I postulate here, and I think this is what Simon was alluding to a, a moment ago, is Para 99.5 really the right provision for the company's obligations under furloughed contracts? And I, I think there's probably some fairly persuasive arguments for saying that it isn't, and actually it is Para 66, not just because of the uh, quiz closed trust argument, but also because uh, furloughing employees uh, as a result of the coronavirus pandemic is, is very different to adopting contracts in a run of the mill administration. Uh, it might be thought that Para 99.5 is not needed uh, in these circumstances, and Para 66 provides the answer. Um, th this thought also uh, drives that point home. Uh, in, in a normal case, the administrator has 14 days in which to think whether or not they want to adopt the contract. Of course, when the scheme ceases, that 14 day period doesn't start again. However, if the scheme or the payments received under it never come within the scope of Para 99.5, so that that, for example, may be disapplied in this kind of context, then the 14 days might start after the scheme is withdrawn, in which case that would probably be a fairer period of time for the administrators to make a decision as to whether or not they want to keep the employees on or terminate the contracts. Um, Simon, so that, that was the, um, I, I think, the, the insolvency unintended consequence. And I know that um, uh, Julian and Debbie, I think, have some some employment ones as well, traps for the unwary. Well, yes, um, very quickly, um, th these are a few questions that um, we thought of that might be of interest to the audience. Um, the first one is the obvious one, which is the unresolved Carluccio's employment issue, and that is whether or not there's a duty to send a further letter. As we know from paragraph 108 of the judgment, um, it was submitted that um, the administrators were under a duty to employees to go one step further and send a letter which indicated that even non-responders would be taken to accept the offer of variation so as to enable application to be made in respect of them under the scheme. Given what I said before about um, the, the duty to apply um, in cases, all cases other than in respect of those employees that objected, in my, in my view there is um, such a duty um, viewed through the employment prism. But the, su the sub follow question is, is this adoption is a question really that I think Simon or Stefan may be better placed to give us some insight on. And I think, again, the answer is going to depend a lot largely on timing. Um, and in some respects, the, the answer to the question is quite easy enough as it isn't, which is this is it strikes me that the sending of the letter is itself positive conduct, which is consistent with the employment continuing existence. Obviously, if it's sent within the 14 days, then it can't amount to adoption because statute tells us it can't. If it's sent outside the 14 days, then it strikes me that it probably does amount to adoption. The more tricky question, of course, is um, the, what the consequences are of the acceptance or otherwise of the letter, because in Carluccio's itself, Mr Justice Snowden made the point that where you've got a letter that's sent out that says, please respond saying if you'd like to be furloughed or not, and the non-responsive employees accept it after 14 days. That's not adoption by the administrator because there's been no positive act on the administrator's part, or rather their positive conduct's happened within the 14 day period. The fact that the, the contract is then varied is because it's accepted by the non-responding employee at a later date. So far, so fine. But what strikes me is the perhaps more difficult question to which we don't have a ready answer is what if the letter from the administrator, rather than saying, please tell me if you want to accept, says, if I do not hear from you by X date, you will be deemed to have accepted the offer of uh, very employment. Because if X date falls outside the 14 day window, one can see arguments either way, you, depending on who you're acting for. If you're an administrator seeking to argue that you haven't adopted that contract, you would say, well, the thing that made the variation occur was the passivity on the part of the non-responding employee. It was nothing that I did positively and so therefore I haven't adopted. One could mount a case for saying though that by sending out a letter within the 14 day period that presupposes that an, a, a contingent event will happen in a date after the 14 days, 
by not recalling that letter or taking other steps, you should be treating it having impliedly entered into conduct with the doctor's contract. Don't profess to have the answer to that one. I think that's one of those imponderables that's thrown up by the uh, the litigation and um, and by the new legislation that we we'll have to watch this space on. Indeed. Um, I suppose the next question then is uh, is one for, for Debbie, I guess. What happens to yeah. full employees' terms and conditions upon a cheaper transfer? I'll pick up this one. Effectively, it's business as usual so far as 2P is concerned. The terms and conditions that were in effect prior to the transfer will transfer over, and that will include any temporary variations that uh, had been agreed. And of course, when that temporary variation comes to an end, the original terms and conditions of employment. So uh, no impact so far as 2P is concerned, usual rules apply. And, and while I'm here, I'll look at Reg 8 also. Again, there's, there's no significance here. Um, regulation, of, uh, regulation 8 of 2P, of course, includes a number of statutory schemes where liabilities don't transfer. Furlough scheme is not one of them. So uh, no help so far as Regulation 8 is concerned. Again, it's business as usual. So then what's the relationship between furlough and layoff or short time? Um, is, is there a relationship? Um, well, other than the transatlantic um, jargon, um, given our cousins across the pond who use furlough more frequently and have done for years, and our recent um, awareness of it in March, um, other than that, 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 that linguistic point, there is um, no relationship at all between furlough and layoff or short time. Um, indeed, layoff in short time is such a residual category of, 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 um, of, of process that um, it's unlikely to be relevant in the vast majority of cases that we'll be looking at in the next few months. And okay. so that's the next question of pay, Debbie. Yeah, I'll pick up this one. Um, needs to be remembered that furlough pay, defined as regular pay, has a very specific meaning and some exclusions that we absolutely do not find when we're calculating a week's pay for the purpose of employee entitlements under the Employment Rights Act, including, for example, redundancy payments. For example, furlough pay excludes any payment which is conditional upon performance, and there are a number of others. So do be aware that when any final reckoning comes to take place, there will be some discrepancies that need to be taken into account. Let me pick, al pick up also on the next bullet point, which is a uh, reference to a Section 4 statement. Let me explain that. Section 1 of the Employment Rights Act requires an employer to send to an employee um, an, an itemised statement in writing of the main terms and conditions of employment. Um, section 4 says that when changes are made to those principal terms and conditions, they need to be notified in writing at latest within a month of the change taking effect. And those principal terms and conditions include terms relating to remuneration, which clearly would be affected. So uh, the, the point that really strikes me is that sending of a Section 4 letter confirming changes to the uh, principal terms of employment from what you've said, Simon, if this post states the 14 days protected period, that may well also amount to adoption, even if everything else, including the application for and receipt and payment out of payments from HMRC, has taken place within the 14 days. I think that must be right. Sending the letter is clearly positive conduct. The only reason to send the letter is because the administrator is working on the presumption that the contract of employment remains in existence, albeit varied. Um, and so on that basis, that would probably be caught if it's outside the 14 days by the same reasoning that applied in Paramount and in Carlo shares and in Debenhams. So I think the answer there, I think the answer there, if the timeline works for you for all the other positive acts that may amount to adoption, um, I, I think it's to have sent out at the outset, isn't it, um, those amended terms and conditions that will apply in the event that the variation is accepted. And that leaves the final point on the slide. Um, which is just a residual question, I would think, in most cases, which is whether furloughing is a breach of the implied term of trust and confidence. In some cases, it could be envisaged that a particularly senior employee um, may view um, the being placed on furlough and the, uh, the, the accompanying reduction in pay as being, as being a breach, particularly if there were um, other reasons as to why that employee might not otherwise view themselves as being within the scope of someone who might be placed on furlough. Um, so query, it's a practical issue we've borne in mind, because, for instance, if you have a, a business in which that high level employee um, is particularly important um, 
in respect to customer connection or otherwise, and there are um, restraints within their contract of employment in respect of competition, that there might be a potential for an argument based upon repudiation that, um, that, that, that might enable that employee to, to free themselves from employment and go off and do some sort of mischief. And one might want to avoid that process if you're in the process of trying to sell on an undertaking in this process. So I think that's probably the potted answer to that question, given the hour. Um, so thank you very much for the employment side of things. Um, just before before I, I sign off, um, just like to, to mention that we do have a another employment session coming up soon, which is the um, breakfast bite session that Debbie and Kerry Gardner are doing on the 1st of May. And so please feel free to sign up to that if you if you wish to um, have, uh, revisit some other employment issues um, um, that are relevant at this time. Thank you very much. So I think that covered all of the uh, unintended consequences we'd alighted upon. Um, I think to save one, which is Stefan obviously mentioned paragraph 66 as being potentially the better route to paragraph 99. And of course, full disclaimer from council, that would be the preference for us because in, that means in every single administration where you want to furlough <laughs> someone, you're going to have to make an application to court and instruct someone to go along and argue the toss. So I can see why that may not be a complete answer in, in sort of commercial and pragmatic terms. Um, we've not picked up on any questions coming through the chat as we've gone along, other than Hugh asking whether Debbie, Stefan and I are all in the same room, to which the answer is yes, in a sense. Um, if anyone does have any um, questions more substantively on the legal issues raised, uh, then please do feel free to either raise them now in the chat, or alternatively turn on your microphones and raise them orally. Um, if there's anything that occurs to you after this call, um, or you're particularly shy about raising it in front of everyone else on the call, then the chat function, I understand, will remain open for at least half an hour after the end of this call. So if you want to add anything to that, we'll try and deal with that offline. Equally, um, if you want to send an email to any of us uh, and our addresses are available on the Guildhall website, then we'll do our best to answer any queries that you have insofar as we can. Um, we'll remain online for another five minutes or so if anyone does have any questions. Uh, but if not, thank you very much for attending and we hope you found this useful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, question from Lisa, uh, which I think I can happily throw over to my employment colleagues because it's such a tricky one. Uh, what do you think about holiday pay and sick pay being payable by the JRS? Well, as, as what do we think about it? Um, the holiday pay issue is yet to be resolved and there have been some calls from many quarters for, for that to take place. And similarly with a sick pay um, position, the, the question of whether SSP should be exhausted or an employee um, returned before they can be furloughed. Alternatively, whether it is possible to furlough someone on sick leave, it's still a vexed one. Um, so we have six versions of the guidance. We're desperately awaiting seven and holiday and sick pay are two of those where we're particularly awaiting more information. Um, all we know, for, for example, on holidays is that employees um, can uh, take leave um, during the fellow period and that payment is due at 100%. Um, so someone furloughed at 80% would need to be paid at 100% during any holiday period. The extent to which employees can be required to take holiday during furloughing, whether that breaks the three weeks of furlough that's required as a minimum for the payment to be made is another matter that we're yet to hear. And I think that reinforces the point, doesn't it, Stefan, that if the paragraph 99 analysis is right, then there may be some administrators going to have to fund out of out of pocket expenses in any event, where if the, those, those decisions are subsequently overturned and suddenly a quiz close trust analysis or paragraph 66 route, then it would be easy for an administrator to limit what they have to pay out to employees to the monies coming in through the government and, and nothing more. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think I, I see Lisa's um, followed up her, her question, what can administrators do? And I, I think the answer is either seek to argue that the, the receipts are subject to a quiz close trust and so therefore don't get within 99.5 because they're not within the control of the administrators um, and or be very selective as to which employees are furloughed and which are really truly crucial to be kept on so as to minimise that exposure. I mean, I, I should say that um although wages and salary in power 99 scoops up uh, holiday pay and sick pay it's not I, I think I'm right in saying everything is obviously subject to statutory limits which we, we haven't delved into the weeds, weeds on in this talk but um, have a close look at precisely what is included within that and um, Scott Barrington has asked a question I think or 
at least put in the comment, if a contract is adopted by administrator, are they required to pay the excess 20% not covered by the CJRS? Uh, or do they need to vary contracts to say employees only entitled to the 80% under CJRS? The, the, way, uh, the way it's worked in both Carluccio's and Debenham's is, of course, the variation happened first and then the administrators adopted the varied contracts so that the administrator's liability was to pay whatever was payable under that varied contract, which was deliberately couched in terms that it was, as Stefan said earlier, pay when paid. And, and was only limited to that that came in from the government, albeit with that caveat, of course, that may include on top of it holiday pay and sick pay, which are swept up unless uh, presumably it's been varied to exclude that. But I'm assuming from the employment perspective, you can't exclude in the contract the right to things like sick pay and, and holiday pay. Well, it depends. It depends what type of sick pay and holiday pay you're talking about. Just in answer to Scott's question, there's no obligation on employer um, or administrator to pay 100% um, as furlough pay. 80% is the amount that will be reclaimed. And it, it is standard um, across many industries for 80% to be the figure on which employees have been furloughed. If employers, as a matter of goodwill, want to top up, that's fine, but there's no obligation under the scheme to do so. It may conceivably make it more likely that some employees will say no and object to being furloughed if it's 80% rather than 100%, um, but there's no requirement under the scheme to pay at 100%. And I'm afraid to say, I suspect in the majority of cases, the idea of goodwill will be inconsistent with the duty of the administrator to maximise value for the credit. I think Lisa's posed another one. Determined to make us earn our money, even though this is a free webinar. Uh, short answer is, uh, Stefan, I certainly haven't heard yet anything about the outcome of the Court of Appeal hearing uh, in Debenhams. But no doubt, given, no doubt, given the urgency of the matter, I'm sure we can expect that to be fast-tracked, expedited and something out as soon as humanly possible. You, you may have spotted that Mr Justice Snowden in the Carluccio's case actually gave his judgment on a bank holiday Monday, such was the urgency of getting an answer. And of course, in Debenhams, with the 14 days having um, elapsed or about to elapse pretty, pretty damn quickly, um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if we don't see an answer from that very shortly. Well, I think that probably concludes all the questions um, for today. As I say, if anyone has anything they want to add, then uh, feel free to, to add them in the meeting chat or send us an email. But um, otherwise, we'll sign off now. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you, everyone. Good evening, Thanks. everyone.